Welcome to The Bo Show. I recently attended the first stop of Donald Trump's history tour, interviewed by Bill O'Reilly. O'Reilly and Trump have a 30 year plus friendship, but O'Reilly was trying to figure out what part of the Trump story had not been told. And it was a reflection of what happened in his four years from 2016 to 2020, especially in the president's own words. After all, the media and the left were so excited to move on to Joe Biden that even Joe Biden himself tried to erase as much of Trump's presidency as he could on day one with executive orders. So no one really took time to ponder the successes and challenges of the presidency. O'Reilly did this in a Q&A format with the first half all being Bill's questions and the second half mainly audience questions that were pre-selected. Now both men made a point to say that they had not discussed these questions ahead of time. And Trump knew that O'Reilly is fair but tough, so he just let it rip. O'Reilly also tried to tell the audience that this is not a Trump rally and that this is serious subject matter to cover. I can tell that O'Reilly doesn't like all the cheering and the catcalling, although Trump called that not catcalling but love calling. And when O'Reilly said, we have a new president, the audience booed and began chants of, let's go Brandon. <laughs> Trump appeared a little more svelte physically and was more respectful in tone in this dialogue and format than perhaps I've ever seen him. And I'll explain why as we go along. But ultimately, this gave him a forum to talk about various foreign leaders and adversaries, immigration and border policy, and personnel changes as well. Now, at first, I want to address crowd size because media wasn't allowed at this show. Well, at least not in the way it traditionally is. If you wanted to see this tour, you had to buy a ticket, which I did. There's no special media access or area. When the show was about to begin at 3 p.m., it looked like the crowd was pretty sparse, maybe only half full. I think the show had sold just shy of 10,000 tickets at FLA Live Arena in Sunrise, Florida. But then you had all these people just show up the day of, estimated at about 9,000 others wanting to get in and see it, which they couldn't accommodate. So the media that called this tour undersold and underperforming were inaccurate. They were not accurate at all, but that's not a surprise. O'Reilly opened this conversation by saying that Donald Trump beat two political machines, the GOP and the Democrats, as a businessman and an outsider. And this is almost unbelievable because it has never been done before in American history. The Q&A began with O'Reilly asking Trump about foreign leaders like Putin and President Xi of China and what their relationship was like. Trump described both men as sharp, smart, and at the top of their game. He described Putin as someone with a flair for comedy. However, he told Xi Jinping, you can't do these things to Taiwan. You know, Trump stopped the pipeline in Russia, so Putin respected him. Xi must have as well when Trump said, you can't bully Taiwan. Trump really didn't answer O'Reilly's question about who is a bigger threat of the two. I personally think it's Xi. With respect to the unprecedented speed of getting the COVID vaccine, Trump said that he gambled a bit, but he called it speculation rather than gambling by putting up billions of dollars for Pfizer, Moderna, and J&J &J to get the vaccine out when he was told by most people it would be five to 12 years. The media didn't report on the vaccine coming out until two days after the election, fearing it would give Trump an election day boost. O'Reilly then asked a question I have always wanted to ask Trump. Why didn't you fire Fauci? I honestly thought Trump's answer was a little dodgy. He said that Fauci wasn't a big factor, that basically whatever Fauci did, Trump did the opposite, especially with respect to the China travel ban and masks. Plus, Trump ended some of the money Fauci and the NIH were giving to China. He saw it as wasteful. But Trump said he thought it would cause problems to fire Fauci and he wanted to get along. I just have a hard time believing that because he fired so many others, especially important people like James Comey of the FBI and General Mattis and Rex Tillerson. Why not Fauci? I don't think that answer was clear. When O'Reilly asked Trump if he thought the Chinese government had anything to do with the virus, Trump demurred a bit. He said personally he didn't think so, 
But he said they must pay the price for what happened. However, because they allowed it to happen and protected China, but not the rest of the world. So in this respect, I have to surmise that Trump didn't see COVID as a bioweapon. On the issue of ISIS, Trump said that he made a point to go over to Iraq and ensure that they wiped out 100% of the caliphate and nail both al-Baghdadi and Soleimani in Iran. But Trump's rebuild of the military, he said they were able to decimate ISIS because of that rebuild. Another provocative question was why Trump didn't fire General Milley, the guy who has been very much in the hot seat for the Afghanistan withdrawal. Trump said, <laughs> he kissed my ass, he was fine. <laughs> That's quote, unquote. <laughs> but two things made Trump lose respect for Milley, he said. One was when Trump was doing a drawdown of troops in the Middle East. Trump said, I want every nut and bolt of all of our equipment to be returned because even the Apache helicopters were there. Milley said to Trump, it'll be cheaper if we just leave it. And so Trump thought he was an idiot for wanting to leave our technology and equipment, especially Bagram Air Force Base, which we could keep as a base to keep a watch on China. The other thing that made him lose respect for Milley was when Trump walked over to that small church that BLM had defaced and burned near the White House. You'll remember this. Milley walked behind Trump on the way over there. And then later, he submitted an apology for walking with Trump over there. So after those two events, Trump had no respect for Milley. The discussion then turned to the border with O'Reilly asking Trump why Biden has opened the border. Trump said that he wanted people always to come legally. He thinks that Mitch McConnell and Paul Ryan really me messed things up in terms of legislation. And Trump took one extra jab at Paul Ryan by noting that Ryan is on the board of Fox News and indicating that this is why Fox News has changed so much for the worse. Ryan is a never Trumper. Here was also a unique bit of info. When Trump requested the things he wanted from Mexico, both the Mexican government and the American diplomats told him, this will never happen, it never has. And Trump said, yes it will, and threatened to slap a 25% tariff on Mexico if his demands weren't met, especially because we import so many of their cars. Not only did Mexico acquiesce, but they instated the remain in Mexico policy in which migrants must wait in that country while their cases are being adjudicated. A policy that even Joe Biden has reinstated but doesn't want anybody to know about that. Now came the question about January 6th, perhaps the most touchy of all topics. Trump says that he suggested 10,000 National Guard troops for that day, just as a precaution. That has to be implemented by Congress, specifically Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer. He says they ignored it, and he has no idea why. He admits that there was a small, small fraction who went into the Capitol, but by and large, his charge was to protest certain electoral results he wanted to see sent back to the state legislators. Not a coup or an insurrection, but a return to be assessed for irregularities and fraud. Now then O'Reilly did a lightning round of Trump's assessments of a select group of individuals. On Biden, Trump says he doesn't know him personally but he would love to see him do a great job because Trump said, I love this country. With respect to whether he's mentally diminished, Trump suggested the same mental aptitude test that he himself took in front of doctors and aced. He also talked about Biden being grossly incompetent. But now this was a shocking measure of restraint from Trump, but it told me that he really doesn't seek Biden's demise. He wants him to do well so that we can all succeed. On Barack Obama, Trump said that they got along well and that he's smart even though he disagrees with his methods. He believes Obama created tremendous division in this country and a unique level of hatred. He also said that when Trump tweeted about his campaign being spied on, social media created the realization that they'd all been caught red-handed. On Mike Pence, and the crowd definitely booed here when his name came up, Trump said he's a good man but that he should have sent those votes back to the state legislatures. And he referenced Thomas Jefferson with respect to his actions with the state of Georgia. Now, I wanna explain this. In the election of 1800, Jefferson was the sitting vice president. 
and as such, he also doubles as president of the Senate, who certifies the state electors, the very position Mike Pence was in. Jefferson noticed an irregularity in Georgia's ballot that looked very different from all of the rest. And history depends on this, because Jefferson is making a judgment call about whether he will be the next president of the United States or not. Georgia at that time was prone to corruption and backroom deals among Federalists and Republicans. This seems to still be true today, perhaps. But the Constitution is not very clear on what to do. And I think Trump was indicating that Pence had the choice of whether to certify those votes or send them back to the legislatures to reevaluate problems. That seems to be Trump's beef with Pence. With respect to Ron DeSantis, Trump also took a bit of circumlocution and referenced his endorsement of DeSantis for Governor of Florida, which led to his victory. Finally, regarding Liz Cheney, Trump called her a warmonger and a disaster for people from Wyoming and America. He didn't mince words on her. The show then broke for brief intermission, and then they returned for questions from the audience that O'Reilly read. One of those questions was, what would you have done any differently in your four years? And Trump said, certain personnel changes. Of course, we know that he fired and replaced a lot of people, but he never fired Fauci or Milley. I think it probably took Trump a while to figure out who was really for him and with him and who was a, a closet rhino or a party loyalist or even a globalist for that matter. Trump called the best part of his job the difference you can make, and the worst part of his job all the needless investigations, and he referenced Shifty Adam Schiff and his fraud. Trump returned to world leaders and referenced North Korean President Kim Jong-un, and this, I gotta tell you, was a hilarious story. He said that when he met with Kim Jong-un, he asked him, have you ever heard of Elton John? And Kim Jong-un replied, no which isn't shocking because they import zero Western or American culture. He said, have you heard of the song Rocket Man? Which Kim Jong-un, of course, did not know. So Trump said, well, I've brought it for you. And it's not gonna be on a player that's made in South Korea because I envision you riding this magnificent rocket and I call you Rocket Man. Apparently, Kim Jong-un got testy and said, no, 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 you called me little rocket man. <laughs> Apparently after that, things in their relationship improved. But isn't that interesting? And by the way, a lot of Trump's pre-show music playlist before the show includes Elton John. But what a measure of musical diplomacy. He brought a song to flatter Kim Jong-un in a way, but also humble him. Trump feels that keeping those enemies close prevents nuclear war. And he says without a doubt, global warming isn't our biggest problem or threat. Nuclear warming is. A nuke war would be catastrophic. So he kept Putin and Xi and Kim Jong-un at bay in this way. Now, here's another story that Trump told that has up to this point, I believe, been unheard. When he met with South Korean President Moon, we had about 30,000 troops in South Korea there for their protection. Trump said, we're protecting you from Rocket Man, as we now know. So Trump said, you have to pay us. Moon said, no, we, we have never paid you. But Trump said, you're very wealthy, especially with all the electronics and cars that you export. Trump was able to get Moon to agree to pay 1.1 billion to us as a result of this negotiation. But Biden surely has abandoned that. So they've lost respect for us. Just like every other country has lost respect for us after Biden's Afghanistan failure. And with respect to the environment, Trump said, we clean up and they don't, meaning China, Russia, and India. It was costing us a trillion dollars and them none. So he ended the Paris Climate Accord, not because he doesn't want a great environment, but because the deal was sweet for them and not for us. On the topic of Cuba, Trump was pretty emphatic. He said, we need to free Cuba. He said we had communist Cuba at the brink of folding because we had them checkmated by cutting off Venezuelan oil. He had them at the brink. Then he lost the election and Biden went soft and did nothing. So now Cuba is back to its old ways. 
On China, Trump is still emphatic on them paying the penalty for this virus and what it did to our economy. He believes in tariffs, tariffs that now Biden has totally abandoned. On the racial issue, a question came up about how he handled the riots in the aftermath of George Floyd. Trump said that he recognized that these riots were happening in Democrat-run cities, all of them, and that he could just basically stand down and let them figure it out at the local level and fall on their own sword. But he did send in National Guard troops to Minneapolis to help out. He believes that tepid prosecution of rioters, looters, and arsonists is simply not enough. It's not a deterrent. He wants police to get their power back. Finally, O'Reilly pointed out that in a Gallup poll, Trump would run away with about a 70% choice as president among possible GOP contenders if he does run in 2024. He wanted to know who a good VP might be. Trump dodged on this, only mentioning Tim Scott and what a strong guy he was. He never mentioned DeSantis or a female or anything like that. It was unclear whether Trump was teasing another run, but he certainly looked like he had the ambition and the energy and the stamina. It all comes from his desire to make America great again. So now that I've covered the, the nuts and the bolts and some unheard revelations, I'll talk more in general terms about this show at the 30,000 foot level. I think that O'Reilly let Trump ramble a bit. We know Trump is prone to rambling and I thought that he would rein that in or at least press harder for answers that he usually gets. However, he didn't. Now, Trump set a more respectful, reflective tone in this format that wasn't as rally-esque, I guess you could say. It's like he didn't need to go full alpha male. He knew that he was in friendly territory. It was insightful to see how he made various decisions and broke certain molds and got things done that no one had before. This is where I think that his business acumen was critical. He saw political juggernauts as worth tackling and redefining. He talked about how his foreign policy was both one of lethal decisions, like with ISIS and General Soleimani, and a more reserved respect with our nuclear adversaries and how he dealt with them. It's like he toyed with their egos because he has a big one himself. Who would ever have thought an Elton John song could keep nuclear war from breaking out? And he wanted other countries to pay their fair share and not rip us off for how we protect them. NATO wasn't paying us anything. Under Trump, they did. He got Mexico in line as well. Now, our border is a mess, of course, now, but I also think his comments about Biden and Obama were telling. He wished them well, even if he disagreed with their methods and their policies. He could go for the jugular, and he didn't. He just recognized the damage that they have done, and he wants better. Finally, and I think this is a big one, he was asked how we can change bad, false, corrupt journalism. And Trump said that we have to change the libel laws so that media can be sued for false reporting. The Sullivan Supreme Court case needs to be revisited, he says. Bad journalism really diminishes our country. And it was no more obvious than during four years of the Trump presidency. True libel happened. And there wasn't much consequence. Because, you see, the bigger a public figure you are, the more things can be said about you without repercussion. That has to change. We know that CNN's ratings are in the dump, but how do you reform that? They don't want to reform. They're trying to maintain the little shred of ideological zealots that they have. Firing Cuomo was minor in the grand scheme of things. So what I took away from this brand new tour is that Donald Trump still has a lot to say and a lot to do. His story won't be told by major media. In fact, here I am as one of the messengers. What I'm recounting to you is something you're not going to hear about, but I feel obligated to share it. Trump is still a master showman, but I think I learned more about his business tactics and keeping us out of strategic wars than I previously knew. And especially as a musician, I was so interested in the Rocket Man story. For a man his age to be that mentally agile and tactical is impressive. Biden could not do this interview. The Democrats have some serious work to do because Trump and DeSantis and others have the energy and the momentum on their side right now. I'm Bo, and that's the show.